Hello, this is Kerwin and Keith of Father Sun Galaxy. Our guest in this episode is Leland Shi, a Lucasfilm veteran for over 25 years. Leland serves as senior creative executive for Lucasfilm franchise content and strategy, which is involved in Star Wars storytelling across all platforms, including films, TV, books, and games. As a keeper of the Holocron since 2000, Leland manages Lucasfilm's Holocron continuity database used to track well over 100,000 characters, events, locations, and pieces of technology created for the Star Wars universe. He is also the lore advisor on Lego Star Wars animated content, notably on the series Freemaker Adventures and a trio of specials, the Lego Star Wars Holiday Special, Terrifying Tales, and Summer Vacation. Leland Chi, welcome to Father Sun Galaxy. Hello. Thank you so, so glad much. To finally meet you. This is a pleasure. Thank you. Tell us the story behind the name Keeper of the Holocron. <laughs> um, well, uh, as, uh, as as you mentioned, um, I'm I have a database called the Holocron, and so uh, when I was first hired uh, by Lucas, I worked in the licensing department. And they asked us to, uh, they, we, the job opening was for a continuity database. And so uh, to track all the Star Wars lore that we were developing at the time. And, and this was in 2000 um, when, when Wizards of the Coast, a company called Wizards of the Coast, got the license for the RPG. Uh, and they wanted to have a repository for, for all of Star Wars lore that was being created at the time. The prequels were coming out. Uh, but there's, there was a game, there was books, and there hadn't been a, a database to track the lore for all that material at that time. So uh, prior to that, a lot of uh, there was just a lot of word documents and physical binders um, that you would have to find this information. And so uh, I was hired to put all that information into a database. And then, um, you know, my first week there, I'm building the database and um, it was the director of publishing, uh, Lucy Lucy Wilson, who said, "Okay, you're you're, you're building this database. What are you going to name it?" And I was like, "Wait, I get to name the database?" And 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 instantly, it's like, "Okay, it's got to be the Holocron." And and for people that are immersed in Star Wars lore, the Holocron is a is a it's actually it's like a it's a it's a cube shaped item used by you know we all know this star wars fans all know this but yes. for if, if you're one of the few that don't know this uh, <laughs> watching this podcast um it's a database used by the jedi as a repository of star wars lore and so i mean this was the obvious choice for uh what to name the database now in 2000 the only people that knew about holocrons were people that read the comics and read the books you know hadn't really extended into publishing now you see those see them in animated content um you see props the the thought that you could actually go to disneyland and buy a holocron in 2000 was like the wildest thing uh so uh it, it's it's been really cool to see how expansive the world of just holocrons has grown grown um and so uh i was i would mentioned wizards of the coast they were the first per, uh that was the first group to put me in uh credit it, credit that uh, in a book in their first rpg that they released uh with keeper of the holocron and it sort of just stuck keeper of the holocron had been a term that was was created in the in the comics that went along with 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 the the device itself and so uh the idea was that uh it would project an image of a of, a, of the famed Jedi, um, and they would they were known as the keeper of the holocron. That was the the individual Jedi had their own holocron, and it was their their image that came up and uh, gave knowledge to people that were seeking uh, that that had opened it and to share all the lore of the Jedi. So long story, very short. <laughs> uh, I got that name in 2000 and it's just stuck and it's because of the database that I built. So is there a website for this um, holocron data? 
Uh, so the Holocron is an internal database. So, uh, you know, we, we all know that there are internet sites, there's Wikipedia, even before there was Wikipedia, there was something called the unofficial Star Wars Encyclopedia. So there's always been sort of repositories of, of, of lore uh, for Star Wars that are available fans and, and lots of people have their own, there have always been websites tracking, you know, the, the most minuscule, you know, the, the most granular detail of Star Wars knowledge. Uh, but what this, the Holocron database that we have, it tracks content that's as it's in development. And that's the key is, is because our group needs to know what all the other groups are, are doing so that they can talk to each other. That's one of the challenges that, we, that, that big franchises face uh, when doing what we, they call this transmedia. When you have different platforms that are telling a singular cohesive story that are working in the same universe, that are sh using a shared universe. Um, and so this transmedia storytelling that we're doing uh, to be able to do that, someone's got to know, has to know what's going on across all the different groups, what, what's happening in film, what's happening in games, what's happening in publishing. And what generally tends to happen is uh, groups get siloed in the group that they're in. So the film people, they're, they're focused, they're, their main focus is what's going on in the film. The, the live action series people, they're focused on their one thing. And, and what our group does is uh, have a hand in all of that storytelling storytelling so that we can make it talk to each other and the way that you have to be able to do this or the, what you need to be able to do this is to have a singular in my case uh having a singular tool where all that information can be stored uh as it's being developed now that's the key is, is as it's being developed because uh if you wait till it comes out then you're already you know you're already two years too late maybe five years too late on something on on something that's was in the work, you know, that's already in the work. So uh, by ha by having the shared knowledge, uh, you can sort of like bypass, you can you can avoid obstacles, you can put stakes in the ground. Or, okay, we're gonna tell storytelling in this era. Um, we are gonna use these characters. Uh, let's not, let's not, let's, we gotta make sure that the, those, those different channels of storytelling don't compete with each other. So it can't be made public because there's so much uh layers of secrecy that have to be that have to be in place uh that you could not make this thing public okay you once said your job is to know more about star wars than anyone else what's an example of something you know about star wars that a fan might not uh <laughs> i i there's a, there first off there there is a team of us uh there are what we call if it's a, it's a super deep cut there's a group called the six six um and there are six of us lore keepers pablo hidalgo is part of that group matt martin is part of that group emily scutani is the part of that group uh so we are the six six and so for me to say uh, you know you know the know most about star wars is is you know i'm in, i'm in pretty great company in terms of of uh like the the masters of the lore uh sorry what was the, the question was what do i know that other people uh i have been super steeped in hatties for the, you know the past couple of years i've amassed a lot of hatties experience uh translating hatties so uh one thing that i got to do for the lego star wars holiday special was uh create the lyrics to Jingle Bells and Hutties. So uh, Joe Blasto, I, I you you can go to the, the whatever the Vivo. I have a a, a songwriting credit for for Joe Blasto and Hutties. I want I want to talk about um, you becoming a Star Wars fan. So let's go back. Um, tell me about your experience of seeing Star Wars for the very first time. And how did that movie impress you? So, I'm you know I'm one of the OG fans. You know we're 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 of the, we're of the generation of the OG. Yes, we fans. are. Yes. When uh, we we were, we were fans when Star Wars came out. So uh, in 1977, I was I was six years old, and those movies were coming out. They came out for the for six years. You know between 
1977 to 1983. A, a very, I was, I was like the prime age to be, to, 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 to embrace Star Wars. It, it was, it felt like it was made for me. Um, we had the action figures, we had the soundtrack, we had the storybook on records. Uh, and so I had just immersed myself in, in every facet of Star Wars that, you know, trading cards, uh, you name it. If it had Star Wars on it, I, you know, I, I wanted to try to get my hands on it. Uh, the very first thing that I saw for Star Wars was even before it came out, I saw, uh, uh, you know, cities like to have like local television. So we had a local television show called Creature Features. And it was like, it was like, it would air on like Saturday nights at 1130. And that was the first they had, they, they had, uh, the host was a, a man named Bob Wilkins and on Creature Features, they showed the, this, the scene with the, the, the Millennium Falcon, uh, with the TIE fighters attacking, uh, the Millennium Falcon. And that was my, that's my first memory of it. My, my six year old memory of it. Um, I remember seeing the movie at a theater called the Coronet Theater in San Francisco. Unfortunately, the Coronet is not there, uh, but it, it is this sort of classic uh, theater. There was a line going around the block. This is the this is when you know blockbusters were first becoming a thing, and 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 you saw people literally lined around the block to get into this movie. Uh, and I so I remember driving by, seeing the line. There was just a a huge fervor for this film because there had no, been nothing like that, at least in my, in, you know, in my six year old brain, uh, like that, that, that was that big and that had just captured everybody's attention. Now, nowadays you've got lots of movie, you got a new movie every week. It's, it's, it's hard to compete for the intention, but for then, back then, Star Wars, came out in the theaters and it was around for a long time. Yeah. It was in theaters for months um, because you didn't have, you didn't have, you didn't even have VHS tapes where you could go watch Star Wars over and over again. You know, the only place that you got Star Wars was sitting in the theater, reading those, all those, those books that you have, listening to the storybook um, uh, and, and, and through these other, other ways, but, but you didn't have it. You couldn't watch the film itself unless you went to a theater. Uh, during that first run. Yeah. yeah, you're right. Right nowadays, there's a lot of content, but back <laughs> in between 77 and 83, we only had the three Star Wars films and we had to wait every three years for the next movie. Now, now we, we, did have, we did have a few other things. We did have Star Wars Holiday Special. Okay, all right, well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, Star Wars would did. show up on shows like The Muppet Show and... Yes. Donnie and Marie, it would show up on, there was a Richard Pryor special. I remember the Richard Pryor special. I had that one. I, I taped that one because they had the actual Cantina aliens uh, in that special that they, that were in the film used for this Richard Pryor special it was, it was amazing. Wow. I, I didn't know about the Richard Pryor special. I had to look for that. I had no idea. But, it's, it's, it's pretty fantastic. Yeah. And you and I also lived in a time where there was no Star Wars, right? Between the years oh, yeah. 1983 and 1999, 16 years, no films, no new films. Yeah. What did you do? It was do? rough. It was rough. It was, uh, yeah. that time was. It, it, it was. And, you know, and, 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 the, and the reason, one of the big reasons why it was so tough is because you did not have people to talk with yeah. about Star Wars. That fandom that you had held, that we had held for six years, that had encompassed our lives so much, when Star Wars went away, we didn't have the internet to be able to find other people that love Star Wars, um, and people just weren't talking about it. You couldn't go to a store and get a, uh, you know, a, a birthday card for, for Star Wars because it just sort of wasn't in the zeitgeist. Now there were things that that there, you know, that we. There were there was the star star tours opened up during that period, but um, it wasn't something that was capturing everybody's mind 
uh, at that at that point because because by then people were were moving on. We were moving on as well. We were getting older. Um, so you it was it became a lot harder to justify getting action figures. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, you kind of sort of it, it became a more of a private thing in your Star Wars fandom during those those, those very fallow days. I'm sorry, I, I cut your I cut your question. Off. No, no, that you're actually that that was going to lead into my question. Now, what did you, how did you pass your time in those 16 years? So it sounds like you didn't put Star Wars aside. It was still that was the th- that was yeah. the thing was yeah. was um for f- through middle school i justified getting action figures because i was gonna make stop motion animated mm-hmm. movies with them i was yeah. I, I wanted to make it so i i took my you know e- little ewok figures and and I, this is before this is before i didn't we didn't have a vhs camcorder at the time we shot on uh eight millimeter film and you had you shot it you hope for the best and then you, you you sent it off to get to get developed, and then uh, you got it back, and you just hope that something that you got something. Uh, it 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 was a lot harder to create Star Wars your own little Star Wars stuff uh, at that time. And then you also had the issue you don't have the issue now is there you never had anyone to share it with, right? Yeah. You could make these things, but sharing that sharing what you made you, you there was not a way to share that uh it's a, it's a much different time the way that the internet and youtube and uh cre- like the idea of of a podcast or or uh, you know an interview show where people are from across the country from across the world get to share their 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 love of star wars or uh, their share their love of whatever it is they 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 are uh in into is so so drastically different than what we were going through in the the 80s and 90s yeah yeah I, it was yeah i for me i not that i forgot about star wars because you know you couldn't you know it was always you you know at there was at a, a point in time in the late 80s early 90s that you did have vhs and it came out on vhs or it came on on DVD at the time, but I I, I managed to to put it aside um, only because of two persons that I really think got me through those sixteen years, and it was Steven Spielberg and John Williams, and you know what those two put together um, when they were working together or they were working individually is pure magic in the movie theaters. So it still gave me a reason to go back to the theaters because they're- Can I, can I add a third yeah. group to that? Sure. Industrial Light and Magic. I was about to get there. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. Because even though Lucasfilm, even though Star Wars was not there, Lucasfilm still existed through ILM. Absolutely. That's right. Yeah. And, I, and from what I understand, the reason why there was such a wait uh, for the next Star Wars film is George Lucas wanted to make sure that the technology was where it needed, where he needed it to be in order for him to make the prequel trilogy. And it, and it was a long wait. Yeah. And it was, it, we never really sh- were sure when it was, I mean, like that wait happened. It began in the nineties, in the early nineties. And you would hear rumblings about it. And then, then something would happen. And then it went, it sort of go away and so you we didn't have a date that was the thing is like there wasn't a, a date that said okay 1999 is when this movie is going to come out you know it was just like oh yeah he's working on it he's working on it he's working on it uh and then um before 1999 the the, the, the big date that 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 changed the trajectory of my life um was was january 31st 1997. Mm. And that was the day that the special edition came out. The special edition mm-hmm. was, I remember before that came out, there was, there was, we had magazines back then, Entertainment Weekly magazine. Yes. Had a cover story that said the biggest gambles of 1997. Star Wars was a gamble. Like they did not know 
if people would want to see Star... And it was a gamble because these are movies that we had had on VHS, on DVD, maybe yeah. even Laserdisc. We'd seen these movies hundreds of times. What? Why would we go to a theater to see a movie mm -hmm. that we had seen hundreds of times? True. So the week before, the, the week of of before for uh, January thirty first, um, Cornet Theater, the, the theater that I had originally seen Star Wars as a kid, uh, was showing the special edition. And I walked by. I think I walked by there on the. It, it came out on a Friday. I I I walked by there on a Wednesday. There were people waiting in line. They'd been waiting in line for five days. They had sleeping bags. Uh, they were so in love with Star Wars. They they Star Wars meant so much to them that they would sleep on the sidewalk in front of the theater, waiting for a movie that they've seen hundreds of times. Uh, to come out and I went there on that Wednesday two days before it came out and I thought oh my gosh my entire life I thought I was the biggest Star Wars fan out there there is no other yeah there's no other Star Wars fan and here they were they were sleeping out for a week in line and I started to doubt myself I was like oh I thought I was big a big right. Star Wars fan but yeah i I'm not sleeping out there. I mean, so it was a, it was a sort of like, you know, you came to this realization like, Oh, whoa, wait, wait, wait a minute. There's other people like me that are out there mm -hmm. that are, that are willing to go to these lengths. Mm -hmm. And so, um, one thing that had happened before, before that Wednesday is I had interviewed at LucasArts. LucasArts was the name of the gaming uh, division of Lucasfilm. And I had interviewed the, the day before, like the day before. Uh, so I was just, I was already kind of on cloud nine because I'd gotten to visit LucasArts and I had a, there was a written part of the, the interview where there was a cardboard, and during the interview, there was this cardboard standee of Darth Vader behind me as I did my interview, that was one of the sort of like distinct memories of that. Um, so uh, the movie comes out Friday, uh, I think it's a Friday, uh, January 31st. I didn't wait a week, but I, I did get up at like four in the morning for a, a 10 a.m. 10 a. showing. So I, I figured I wasn't waiting six days, but I was at least waiting six hours. Um, and by that time the line had swelled um, there, there was like people with lightsabers. There was a guy in a, in a Chewbacca costume, uh, walking around roaring. Uh, there was TV crews there because, whoa, hold on. Star Wars is back. This is an event. Uh, you don't want to miss this. And, um, getting to see it on screen again was amazing. Now, why that date and specifically, is, is so important in my life is I had seen, I saw the special edition and when I got home on my answering machine was the message saying that I had gotten the job at LucasArts. Nice. Very cool. Very cool. So I haven't had to wait in a six hour line since, at least not for, for a Star Wars movie. And when you got that job at LucasArts, uh, what year was that? That was so it was 90, 97. So, so 97. So it was still right before it was, yeah, I got, I found out that day. And then, like, maybe like the next, the next Monday, I was at LucasArts. Got and it. I was, I was testing games. So it, it seems to me that, you know, what you're doing, what you did in your past was shaping your future. So you are a Star Wars fan, but at what point did you not just, became a Star Wars fan, but a historian, because you had to start, you know, paying attention to detail and collecting data about Star Wars early on. So when did you start looking at Star Wars as more than just, you know, a fan enjoying what's on the screen and just really remembering and capturing the moments, the memories and the ships, the creatures? Was it, do you remember that? I, I, I mean, as a fan, I, even before I, I, I joined LucasArts, um, I knew I was, very passionate about the lore you know i mean 
reading all the books and, 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 and collecting the trading cards that trains you to even, even getting the action figures and looking at the back of the card to learn all the characters names of all the action figures. Even back then it's sort of trading, training you to uh, have an eye for that, to have that type of detail. And they had re reference books. They had essential guides. Um, they had the first guide to the Star Wars universe. Uh, so I had those, and 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 because you're you're always hungry for more Star Wars knowledge. Uh, and and the the funny thing is, like sort of like the more that you learn about Star Wars, the more that you learn that you don't know about Star Wars. So uh, I, I I knew the games very well uh what there were there were certain blind spots in my in my knowledge i didn't know the trading card game came had had a bunch of star wars lore that they named different blasters and different ships and different obscure background characters um uh i learned much more about that uh there was another the the, the radio dramas uh we had these radio dramas that would would uh play on npr um Featuring the voices of Mark Hamill and Anthony Daniels. Yes. That has two of those. Yes. Yeah, I actually had that recording. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and they're amazing. And they turned our two-hour movies into eight-hour epics. Yes. Uh, filling all these these details that weren't in the film. <laughs> How did you transition from Lucas Arts to Lucasfilm? Okay, so that so that's interesting. Uh, oh, let me go. Let me go back to. Um, when I knew what I, when I, the moment that I knew what I wanted to do, and that was, uh, as a game tester, I sort of established myself as a Star Wars expert, an entire, in, a, in an entire department full of Star Wars experts. I mean, you had all these people that coming in and they were huge. A lot of them were huge Star Wars fans coming in. Um, so, so to, sort of like to, to make yourself stand out as, as, a, as, as, someone steeped in star wars knowledge in that particular group uh was was something that that sort of uh set set me apart from from what my my colleagues were doing and so one of the projects the the first star wars project that i worked on was a game called rebellion it was a huge strategy game that had you know 60 characters and 100 planets um so and it had a little encyclopedia within that. So uh, as as a game tester, as as a tester, you're 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 going through all those bits of lore, making sure that they're using the right ships, and making sure things are spelled correctly. So even even as a game tester, I was using some of those skills. Um, but it was the project. There was something called Behind the Magic, uh, and back in the '90s, there weren't the late '90s. Like DVDs were brand new. Uh, but what they they were called multimedia CD-ROMs were a thing, so you can get an encyclopedia on a CD-ROM, um, and so they had a Star Wars CD-ROM called Behind the Magic, and it was the first time that you could see uh, deleted scenes from the films. This is before you know be again before DVDs became more prevalent, before YouTube, before all these extras that came out later. Uh, this was the first time that you could see deleted scenes, and all these all these scenes that it had a, a different cut of the cantina scene. It had uh, Luke and Biggs um, and all these things that you had maybe you'd seen glimpses of in, in other content or or that, you, you know, you read in the book or you heard it on the radio drama. Uh, getting to see those uh, for the first time was, was amazing. And so this Behind the Magic had the entire script in it. It had uh, hundreds of entries uh, uh, divided into different classes. So it had a section of vehicles, it had a section on characters and creatures and aliens. Um, and it was when I was working on that, when I was just like, this is the greatest. Being able to check to sort of fact check Star Wars on a on a on a product, on a product at, at LucasArts, this was this was the, the dream come true. Now, unfortunately, that product had a great uh <laughs> lead on it where this project was not going to go over. It was going to finish on time. It was going to finish on budget, and uh, sort of that that dream of of working on checking Star Wars lore was 
was just going to last a, a little bit. But but when I was on it, the, the, just the, the three months that I was on it was just like, this is what I, this is, this is where, this is it. I am, I am in my, my zone right there. Fast forward to 2000. So um, 2000 is when uh, Wizards of the Coast gets that, that role-playing game license and, and they, they decide that they want to create a database for it. Now, the, int the other interesting thing about being a game tester is when you're a game tester, uh, you, the job is uh, conveying information through a database to other, the other people that are working on the game, game so they can fix those things. So you enter your bug into the database uh, and, and uh, that information gets sent to the, to the developers and then they, they uh respond back you know what what your database is like and as a a lead tester on 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 games i've been there for three years testing games so i'd become a lead tester behind the magic was the first uh project that i was a lead on you get to customize your database you you have certain needs that you, that this particular database has so i was gaining database experience which i had no idea that it was going to be important to my next job but uh, as, as fate would have it, those three years, not only was I gaining Star Wars knowledge, knowledge, I was gaining database experience. And so when I saw that job opening for someone with extensive Star Wars knowledge and database experience, uh, it was just like, oh my gosh, this, this, this job is so for me. Uh, and then, you know, I, I as luck would have it, I, I I interviewed. I interviewed with Lucy Wilson. I interviewed with a, a man named Bill Slavacek, who was very much a, a, an architect of, of the role playing games and a lot of a lore that was established for those. He also had written some some reference guides. Um, I entered interviewed with them, and and uh, 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 that's how it happened. I mean, it, there were so many things that had to sort of line up for me to get this job. Uh, and and who thought who would have thought that that the database experience would have was was the key uh, skill that I needed for for you know maintaining Star Wars lore. After Disney bought Lucasfilm, there was a plan to take the books written before the acquisition and relabel them as the Legends books. This paved the way for Lucasfilm to create all new canon of books and comics. Could you give us a sense of how much work was involved in the challenges you encountered updating the database to include new characters and storylines? Uh, in terms of creating, uh, it's always it was it's always you know even previous to Disney, it's always a huge flood of information that's that's coming in, whether it's through coming in from video video games or from. Uh, new animated shows at the time, or or in books, uh, or consumer products. It's always a, f a flood of information, and you're always trying to stay on top of it. Of it. Uh, uh, one of the things that that with the with the way that I the databases run, there there was certain things that I could automate. Um, you know, like an encyclopedia, I I could find ways to import that information from the encyclopedia straight to the database. Um, so you try to do as much automation as you can, um, but it's always, you're constantly trying to stay on top of it. So in that respect, pre-Disney, post-Disney, uh, not different in that there was, oh, there's always a constant stream of content. Uh, maybe, maybe the amount of content wasn't, what wasn't as great. Maybe because there, there are different channels of storytelling that we do do now. Uh, with Disney, you know, we didn't have parks. Uh, with the creation of Galaxy's Edge, so much lore was created for, for that. Uh, that was an avenue of storytelling that we hadn't done. Uh, we there's a lot more uh, uh, formats of books that we we hadn't done. So uh, the, the 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 young adult uh, uh, books were not a thing that we were doing at pre Disney and and then post Disney. Uh, Lost Stars was the first sort of young adult uh, novel that we did. So there's a whole nother tier of, of books that we do. Um, and there was some, there was some, you know, there, it was, it was, 
there were some challenges, of course. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the hardest part is, is all these relationships that you had been building, you know, all of a sudden you, you know, in some cases we had new publishers, you know, uh, the, the comics license going from Dark Horse to Marvel, uh, you know, I mean, you, you develop these relationships with, 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 uh, with, you know, writers and editors, and then, and then sort of having to go through that process of, of, of working with new teams. Um, that is always, that is always, depending on what the relationship that you had before, if you had a great relationship, you know, having, having to, to, to work with new people, you know, it, it's, it's, you don't want, you don't want to, you, you develop such a bond with these people that you work with, you know, getting, uh, working with new people is, is, is some, uh, some of the, there's, there's some heartbreak with that. What are your thoughts on the, um, canon changes with Disney Star Wars universe, like completely removed from work as a fan? What do you think of how the canon shifted? <laughs> completely removed from work as I don't think that's possible. <laughs> or at least partially. Uh, um, so I I there was a reason why the expanded universe was an expanded universe. Um because I I know the directives that George was giving us for our content. And I knew that he wasn't beholden to whatever we were doing. Uh, if he was, you know, and it was even very rare that he knew exactly what we were doing in all our, of all our, uh, in all our, you know, books and games. Uh, he, he was, especially during the prequel trilogy, he was very focused on his films. And if he created rules that contradicted what we had done in the books, um, that was that was his prerogative. So, if he suddenly says Jedi cannot get married. Uh, okay, we have to respond accordingly, because yeah, we had, you know, prior to that, we had no idea that that Jedi couldn't get married. So we had Luke Skywalker getting married to Mara Jade, uh, and there were plenty of, of other Jedi that were were getting married. Um, and then you sort of just uh, you just sort of adapt from that point. So at that point, you know, we already we always knew that there were tears. That's and that's why these. If you've heard of the the tears of canon that they, that we talked about uh, when the holocron was first developed, we had we, there was a there was a field in the holocron there and there, there still is, it's, it's it really isn't that different. Um, there was a field that okay this is this is the the material that George has created, which included the films. Uh, he was very involved in Clone Wars, so George that was kind of on the same tier as the the George the the films and I and we say it, we call it George as opposed to film canon because uh he would give us notes for oh, okay there are certain certain rules for the Star Wars universe it might not be in the films um we have we also had notes that George had had from various internal interviews that he would do interviews with author with our authors that authors that were doing the novelizations uh we would have all this backstory that George would would create um, in developing the films. We would send him questions um, in case, you know, in our publishing, uh, a question came up that that maybe George could answer. We would send him questions, and it would be a, like a yes no question. Uh, originally, it would be a yes no question. Uh, later on, it just became um, the head of licensing, Howard Rothman, would sort of like to have a monthly meeting uh, where he, if there were any questions that came up, he could he could. Uh, talk to George about those things. So it was always always sort of separate with George uh, in terms of what we were doing in the expanding universe and what he was doing uh, in his on-screen content in in his films and in Clone Wars. Um, so it was it was there was always a degree of separation. Now the thing is, we have to respect everything that George was doing because that's 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 the content that that the uh, majority of people, the largest high of the audience is they're they're watching the films they're 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 watching Clone Wars and 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 as you get to to other types of platforms uh there's sometimes a, a much smaller smaller audience uh so you kind of kind of have to go with like what are the things that most people are going to know uh so and that would be the stuff that you see on screen now how we made the shift in the database itself 
uh, I didn't delete any of the information that was in there. Uh, I always knew that we could, if there was an opportunity to mine that information and bring back characters that were in the expanded universe, uh, we should we should absolutely take advantage of that because a there's also there's a familiarity with these characters. Um, it saves you from having to cr create something whole cloth, and and also you know there are, these characters have stood the test of time. So when you see a Thrawn appear, uh, there's a reason why Thrawn is so beloved is because that's a great character, right? Uh, and so, uh, why would you why would you want to lose that? Why would you not give yourself the opportunity to use that that if if you have it? So when 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 I, I remember when Dave Filoni said that he, that he was going to show up in Rebels, and we got to have Timothy Zahn, uh, the creator of Thrawn, come to come to Lucasfilm, and and uh, Dave told him personally uh, uh, that we were were bringing him to to, to Rebels. Um, that was a great moment. Well, that's I'm glad you brought that up. That's a very good point. So in other words, if a book is now considered. Uh, non-canon. You don't just remove it from the database. You keep it in there because at any point in time, it's it, yeah. So yeah. it's kind of shifted. It. There's a separate field there for for the stuff that's the legend right. material. Uh, it's so it's there. there. Okay. It's searchable. Uh, we we have all that history mm -hmm. of that, uh, and then and then from there we can decide. Okay, these are the parts that we can use, and maybe there's other parts that that no longer quite fit. Um, but it the important thing is that there is a conscious decision behind all this uh so we, if we are going to make a change you know we know what change we're making we know how different it's going to be um you might be able to gauge some of the fan reaction as to oh, okay they might not you know fans might this is different than what the fans are expecting um but we uh, the key is making an informed decision about it as opposed to the worst thing would be Oh, I didn't know that that book came out, or I don't. I didn't know that 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 happened, um, and that's what our the, part of the role of our group is to sort of make sure that uh, we can make important decisions about that. Uh, we have one final question for you. It's it involves Legos. I know you are very play an important role with the <laughs> Lego animated specials. Keith is a big fan of Legos, if you can tell in the background. I'm a big fan. Yes. I mean big fan. Yeah. This is all. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I think, yeah, what, uh, Leland needs to see it again. I think it was too fast. Bring it up again. Yeah. It's, a, it's a tree. What is it what called? The tree of life? No, just it's a Lego Ideas treehouse. Oh, it's a treehouse. Okay, yeah. Oh, built wow. That's I built that when I was yeah. younger. Yeah, when he was <laughs> four years old, he started building from Legos. I got this bad boy. Yeah. <laughs> Which one is that? I, I, these are not Star Wars sets that, from no, what I can tell. So I'm not, yeah. not as familiar with the. Non There's my team. favorite Star Wars set. That you gotta move your head. Oh, okay. There you go. That's the <laughs> Star Destroyer, right there. The Star Destroyer. Okay, yeah. right. Yeah. That's gotcha. what we do. One of the spider this, crawler for the mid. Let me show you my favorite. Well, I've got two two Lego things here. There's a BD one back. Wow. There. Look at, oh, wow. how about that? You know, this was a. Um, <laughs> sharing things to top each other. <laughs> All right. Raise a oh, raise a crest. Let me, let me show you my la my yeah. last one. I look, I look that Yoda. Very cool. Oh, this, was a, yeah. this was a this was an employee gift. So so at Lucasfilm we have a Yoda fountain. You may have I saw seen it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the Yoda fountain as a as an employee gift. Uh, when you're celebrating May the fourth, they they gave us this. That's set very cool. That, that is a replica of the, the Yoda. You know, if you give me some pieces, I can make like a nice little statue. Just and then you can like, you want. and then you can copy it and put it on everybody's desk. Like I can make a piece from yeah. every movie. <laughs> as long as you give me twenty dollars, I'll make okay. it happen. <laughs> well, so Leland, here's my question about Lego Star Wars. So you were a yes. part of Lego Star Wars Summer Vacation. Uh, we had the the. The, for the, the fortune to good fortune to interview uh, with the director Ken Cunningham and the writer David Shane. Um, there is yeah. a scene in that series where they confirmed that Finn 
is force sensitive because he saw the ghost or the force ghost of Obi-Wan Kenobi. He was talking right at Obi-Wan Kenobi. Now in the rise of Skywalker, there were hints of it that Finn might have been force sensitive, but it wasn't really confirmed. And I think there was a point where Finn wanted to tell Ray something and okay. they never got around to and telling us said, what that know, was. I have, I have a feeling. Or right, right. So there were hints of it. But it seems yeah. in this Lego series, this anime series, it confirmed it. Now, it it, it was it wasn't even summer uh, uh, summer vacation. It, it goes holiday. back to the the Lego Star Wars holiday oh, special. Okay, mm, okay. You know, I have, uh, uh, where where there, Ray is actually training Finn. At, even at that point, Ray is training Finn, uh, and and part of that story is the journey of of Ray becoming a teacher. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, to Finn because because she has to get over uh, this obstacle yeah. that she has of, of, of why she can't. I have a him. question though: Are these Lego shorts canon? Because like, you know how in the uh, Lego Force Awakens game, all the DLCs are canon to the wider Star Wars series. Like, or is there some mix of canonity that these shows have? Because I'm almost certain Ray grabbing a crystal and going on an adventure through the timeline isn't canon, but like. Finn being forced <laughs> and there are differently different then there there are different definitely liberties right, that we yeah, take with Lego yeah, yeah. that we would not take. Uh and it does it's, it's not even just story points, even even things like uh the Emperor and Vader's relationship. Yeah. And them being besties. It's, it's not something that you're gonna you're gonna see in con canonical. So there are definitely elements that are there purely yeah. for fun. But when we're developing these stories, we definitely have an idea of we are definitely looking to where we think the story may go. Um, and yeah, definitely Rise of Skywalker set up those those pieces for, for I mean, he actually has a, a, a moment where he senses where the tower is or at the end there. Um, so he actually does something that demonstrates that he has some some sort of intuition or some sort of, you know, he demonstrates the ability. Or some sort of ability. So uh, it's we we're not making that part up. Uh, whether it it appears in future content, you know, it's anyone's guess. Um, but it definitely we were looking at the pieces that were being set up by by Rise of Skywalker. Kind of I want to work in Lucasfilm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and getting to work on, on on summer vacation, the 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 moment where you actually get to see Ben Solo as a as a as a forced spirit um with with leia um we were we were really thrilled to be able to what's on with <laughs> han's han's not a jedi so whether whether what han is when we see him in rise of skywalker that's that's sort of left open for interpretation because he's not a jedi so obviously he can't manifest himself the way that uh you know Obi Wan. Right. Yoda, yeah, and he's not glowing. Yeah. So no, no. It's not just glowing. like Ben's conscience getting exactly. Specific to ben. Specific like to ben. That's, I don't know. ben is having a dream, or maybe he's just thinking about his dad. That was a really yeah. strange scene, though. I didn't find it strange. I, I I just felt that okay. Well, this was a moment where you know Ben was coming to realize that what is he doing all this for? You know, like, Han did not deserve that. Right. And I think that's what it is. I think that was that guilty conscience that he had, that he had to reconcile with his dad, which he could have done when he was alive, but it yeah. had it had to happen after that, after the fact. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And and the other thing is, I mean, what what filmmaking uh sort of conveyances are they using at that point? Is he is Han really there? Is this all in uh in in Ben's mind? Um and so sometimes you know, different storytellers will 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 tell stories differently, and they will take take advantage of things like flashbacks. Uh, of, of and there's always been crazy stuff in Star Wars, like you know, going back to Empire Strikes Back, Yoda on Dagobah. What is that? <laughs> What's happening there? You know, like what? Just because you're seeing it on the screen doesn't mean it's a reflection of reality in that universe. <laughs> Um, and it, it, is that a storytelling thing? Is that something specific to the place? Um, so there's start. There's always been an element of weird, even going back to the holiday special. I don't know if you've seen the original 1978 holiday special. I have. You and have was, this, a long time ago. Yes. Did yes. you live to tell the story? You, re, you remember at the very end? That, uh, this just occurred to me. That never occurred to me for years and years. At the end of the holiday special. 
Everybody is together in the same place. Now, the whole point was of the whole show was they couldn't get Han and Chewie were rushing to try to get the Kashyyyk. Uh, ha, Luke was somewhere <clears throat> else. Leia is somewhere else. They are in a weird place where they can all be at the same place, but they're on different planets. There, it's it's almost like a I don't know if it's a world between worlds thing. I don't know if it's uh, I don't know force portals or whatever. But there is something weird going on even back in the holiday wow. special. You know, are you sure write an ARG or something? That's interesting. <laughs> I mean, it's been a long time since I saw the holiday special, but I, I do remember them all being together. And then I, Carrie Fisher as Leia started singing a song. Um, oh, yeah. But, yeah. yeah. And, then, and that's not taking place in a Kashyyyk. They all go, yes. all the Wookiees go into a tree. They go into the, the tree right. of life and, and they are in this weird. You know, it's just like ethereal, just space, and there's sort of candles all over the place. But they are not in a re that's not reality that you're seeing there. When Carrie Fisher sings her song, that's they're not in a real space as we know it because we already know that they're all they're on like three different planets. Mm. Wow. Well, you know, fundamentally. <laughs> Star Wars is a bunch of people with special space sabers and magic powers, you know? We, yeah. We've we had 40 it's years fantasy. of this, so we've managed to craft an entire universe out of those fundamental purposes. Think about that. It all started with just, like, a handful of characters. Yeah. Like, right. ten total. You know, you had your main characters, your main heroes, the main villains, and stormtroopers. And that was really it. Yeah. Now we got one of the great things about Star Wars, one of the great things about Star Wars is you yeah. can ask you know ten different people who their favorite yeah. character is, and you'll get ten different. Yeah, answers. and we keep getting new characters. I mean, when the acolyte, and we keep getting yeah, when the acolyte drops, yes. you know, more brand new characters. You know, who's so pumped for the acolyte? <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, very excited to to for that show because we are we are in this all new era in the High Republic era that we haven't seen on screen or at least not in live action um, where we are bring, we are getting to see all new characters that we, we don't know the fates of yeah. these characters. Um, and that's, that's super exciting. Cause you know, that is one of the handicaps with some of the storytelling that we have, you know, even with the prequels, you kind of knew where the story yeah. had to go. Right. Um, Clone Wars, you knew where the story had to go. Um, a lot of the other content that we've done, you kind of know, okay, these characters have to survive. Um, and it's it's getting it's when you have new characters that you don't know what the, the fates of are, uh, where it's really exciting because because none of us know. Uh, that was kind of like you know, it it, it was it's interesting because we get the thing about they should have adapted, you know, the expanded universe, they should have just and you wouldn't get that element of surprise if we were just strictly adapting the expanded universe material. Uh, so those the sequel trilogy really had to be uh, new stories. Speaking of adapting things, I just got a good idea for a Lucas Arts game. <laughs> so like, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you gave us this, uh, unsolicited policy. Here. What's what's your idea? So like, what if you had? Oh, okay. Do you actually want to hear the idea? Or? No, I, you know, I guess if it's your pitch, you know, we don't want to. I'll you know, tell you later. Yes, yeah, yeah. We. <laughs> <laughs> Leland is just, you know, protecting his, you know, his his image, and you, you know, gotta stay sure safe that... out here. No, I'm, 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 I'm also protecting you because if it's a fantastic right, idea, yes, right. you gotta so stay safe. Put your, put your, put your idea that. out there, and it's, you know. You know, for everyone to hear, and I got it. We got it. I'm sure it's a good idea. I can't wait to hear it. Yeah, we'll talk later <laughs> off screen. Thank you, Leland. It, this was a pleasure speaking with you. We, I, you know. And 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 let me just, can sure. I just say, you know, your show, a father and son. Like I have two kids uh -huh. of my own, and. Being able to share Star Wars with our kids is the greatest, greatest joy. And it's not just Star Wars, sharing anything that we love. And, and, and even our kids, 
bringing us to, to new things. Um, you know, that is, that is the, that is one of the greatest joys that you can ask for. And to be able to, to, to have you two doing a podcast about it, talking about what you love, whether it's yeah. Lego, whether it's, um, whether it's X-Men, I, I was I was hoping we get to talk about X-Men 97 episode three today, oh, but I guess yeah, well, yes, you're seen. right. Yeah, I haven't seen it yet, unfortunately. <laughs> I saw it. You yeah. can talk to me. My, my I was floored the entire time oh, watching wow. that. Bombshell. It was just like I I I love the I love the there's relationship issues. There there there's 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 a soap opera element that we don't quite yeah. get with Star Wars. Uh, that that X Men has and oh boy, you yes the the, the recent episode. Wow. Okay, I uh, I'm going so good, so uh, oh, good. I'll, I'll catch it this weekend definitely. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, thank you so much for you know what you were saying about uh, the podcast. You know, you mentioned that there was a time in your life where after the original trilogy ended, that there wasn't really any Star Wars to talk about. Um, not only that, I mean, I, I felt the same way, but not only that, there weren't many people that I could talk Star Wars to because most of my friends and family don't follow Star Wars um, outside of two of my buddies. So I've lived, you know, all of my adult life before Keith came mm -hmm. along and not talked to anyone Hi there. Except, uh, <laughs> about Star Wars. And then, you know, Keith came along right around the time when Disney bought Lucasfilm and then the sequel trilogy was coming out and the, the hype machine was back and you know it, it was an exciting time to introduce him to Star Wars and I had no idea whether he was going to like it or not it wasn't a requirement but I love it yeah I mean it's it's a dream come true you're right to share that experience of something that I loved when I was growing up and now passed it on Star to him. Wars is my life yeah <laughs> okay well it's a party of life but you have other <laughs> interests as well which is cool like Marvel. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah. I exactly. Yeah. So yeah. speaking of Marvel, we need to go see Madam Web again. I need oh, something okay. to laugh no, at. No, we're not gonna talk about Madam Web. <laughs> <make> fun of. <laughs> Did you see Madam Web? I, I guess I yeah. have to ask that. Did question. you see when he was in the Amazon with her mother when she was researching? I, I didn't see yeah. Madam Web. That was that was not a uh, Disney Marvel. It's not. Film, no, so, it's not. Uh, so I can <laughs> diss that. <laughs> no. Okay. All right. So, Leland, where can people find you if someone wants to, you know, maybe uh, check and see what you're up to, or do you have um, social media that you want to share? I haven't. I would say Instagram is. I mean, I don't post a whole lot. Um, uh, Instagram sometimes. So, <laughs> I had a TikTok sp specifically set up so I could sing Joe Blasto. <laughs> so, <laughs> if you want to watch me sing Joe Blasto. Uh, uh, Holocron Keeper on TikTok, Holocron Keeper on Instagram. Uh, those are those are the main. Everybody channels. follow Holocron I'm not on, Keeper. On, on, on yes, Holocron Keeper. Holocron right. Keeper. Yeah. Absolutely. Where can people find us, Keith? <coughs> okay. <laughs> Take your time. You can find us wherever you get your podcast, socials, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Fathers and Galaxy, website fathersandgalaxy.com. Please check out our merch store, fellowsandgalaxy.myspreadshop.com. Donate to our Patreon page, patreon.com slash fellowsandgalaxy. I need that money to buy DLCs. Is that it? Well okay. done. All right. That is it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Leland Chi. Chi for the Thank Holocron. you so much for having Thank me. you so much. This is really a pleasure. All right. Same here. Thank you, everyone, for watching this special episode. Until next time, take care. And, and we will we'll see, see you again. again.